Hey guys, welcome back to the JPM Performance Channel. It's been a couple of weeks, but it's been a busy couple of weeks. So we are back at it, and here we are, our last Thursday in June, June 29th. Hard to believe that next Tuesday will be 4th of July already. We're already into 4th of July. Time flies when you're having fun. So, um, like I said, it's been a couple weeks for a shop tour. I've got a lot of things to show you guys and talk about. So let's just get right into it. So I've had a few of you send me some differentials. Um, it, it appears that a lot of people have been watching the Miata differential video. And so I'm starting to get people send me differentials that aren't uh, comfortable actually doing it themselves, which I'm good with. So if you have sent me a differential in the last three weeks or so, this is your week. I'm working on differentials all week, getting everything done, getting it out. So what we've got here is just a standard uh, Torsen, um, nothing special, 4.3 with the harmonic damper removed off of the pinion and getting it all restored, set up properly and getting this shipped off to the customer. I've got about three of these to do and then a few spec Miatas to do, so we're working on it. Differentials are coming along. So two, three weeks ago, you guys have seen that beautiful supercharged, uh, the track dog racing uh, Miata, the VVT car, um, came into the shop because it hadn't been starting good. Uh, there was excess smoke um, in the breather, and I put it on the dyno, and immediately the dipstick blew out and blew oil all over the place. I'm like, uh oh, we've got ourselves a, a damaged motor. Well, the other thing I noticed when I was on the dyno, the very first pull, is how badly the engine was detonating, and it was detonating because the ignition advance was way too high, especially for a boosted engine. So, here's our tip of the day. I understand how remote tuning has become a popular thing over the last few years with the access to uh, being able to control people's computers and all this and that. The problem is you don't get to hear the car. You don't get to feel the car. You don't get to see the car. And when you're remote dyno tuning, such as what was happening with this blue Miata, things like this can happen. So what we've got here is a broken piston and three of the pistons were totally broken, just like this in the Ringland, from detonation. So you have to be very, very diligent about this. So what these guys want you to do is they want you to make a log, go out on the highway or the road or whatever, make a few pulls, and log it and send it back to them so they can then adjust the tune, send it back to you, you put it back in, do it all over again. The problem is while you're making these runs for, I don't know, four, five, ten miles, you're damaging your engine. So that's what happened to this poor guy's motor. Um, now let me give you a, a flip side. If you're running a bone stock 2020 Dodge Charger and you put an exhaust on it and a cold air intake and there are guys that reflash ecus you know what you're probably going to be just fine but if you're running a boosted miata with a mega squirt 3 and you've got a guy in another state who's trying to remote dyno tune your car i suggest you go to a dyno where the guy can tune it at the dyno so there's my soapbox for the day this guy's getting an engine rebuild because of remote dyno tuning so keep that in mind uh, over here you can see I just finished up the restoration and paint job of the differential case that is over on the bench. Uh, this one was actually pretty bad. Uh, some of these Miatas, depending on, I mean obviously a lot of them are you know 30 years old these days. Um, depending on where you live and the salt and the grime, these can get pretty rusty. So during the restoration process it actually works out really well. So just about done with that, looking really good. Uh, right before I left for the June sprints, I did get Bob's car completed. He's on his way to High Plains Raceway this weekend, 4th of July weekend. They always do their races on holiday weekends out in Colorado for some reason. I don't know why, but they do. So um, he's going to come pick it up tomorrow. And because he's going to Colorado, I made a slight modification to his car. And you will see it popping up out of the hood right here. You see this little hose? You know what that is? 
That is the direct overflow from the coolant surge tank blowing on the windshield. So if this engine overheats again, it is going to completely soak his windshield and I'm betting he's not gonna miss that. So that's my, that's my plan. Um, we'll see how it works because I really don't want to change another engine on this car this this uh, this year. Now I know you guys didn't get to see it a few couple weeks ago because I didn't have all the decals on. John hadn't done all of his magic yet, but here you get a chance to get a good look at the Mazda 2. You know I think it turned out beautiful, uh, nice and simple. We've got all of our decals on, and of course. Some of the most important ones, like Sunoco. Um, super happy to be back in a Mazda, and I've got my Amswell, and of course, Carbotech, Hoosier, all the contingency stuff. So we're actually looking really good. So, went up to the June Sprints with the Mazda 2. First race ever. Um, my very first time driving the car was actually in the paddock area, first, second gear. Just drove it up to the top, brought it back to the bottom, went out for the very first qualifier and the car really handled pretty well. Uh, I was actually very happy with it. However, I could not get the transmission into second gear very easily. So I kind of used this entire weekend as my test weekend for the car. So while it was a bunch of extra work, I actually changed the transmission uh, between uh, Friday morning's qualifier and Friday afternoon's qualifier probably normally wouldn't suggest that but I did have enough time so I'd never changed one of these trainings before it took me about two two and a half hours to do it so I got that done got it back together took that transmission out or took it out on the track for the second qualifier and the spare transmission was shifted just fine so then I was able to start working on um, uh, figuring out what this car can actually do so I'm a big believer in pushing a car basically to its limit so you can find out where the limit is fairly quickly. So actually got up to speed pretty quickly, um, qualified third behind Steve Sargis and Chris Shaftsma uh, for the first race. I wasn't too far off Chris. I think Steve did like a 239.6 and Chris did like a 239 point or a 240.1 or two and I did like a 240.5. So about nine tenths off the pole race got going and believe me guys I haven't been in the middle of the production field in a bunch of years because I've had this awesome BMW that has just performed so well so I have been starting up front and kind of been in clean air it was a lot of fun being you know starting the race in like 13th 15th position overall and working on my race craft again and really being able to work on that and ultimately to be honest um, I think well Steve had a problem only made a lap so, and that was honestly the last time we saw him for the rest of the weekend. But Chris actually had a little better car than I did this weekend. Um, he just had a little more trouble with the lap traffic. So, actually ended up pulling off two wins. So, they have really nice trophies up at, up at Road America. Not just the Super Tour flags, but this is our Saturday trophy. And then for the Sunday trophy, it's basically the same thing, but it's, um, I guess it's like laser etching, I'm guessing onto this wood plaque. It kind of feels like it must be, it's either laser etching or a teeny tiny little, I don't know what it is, but it's really cool. It's an engraved plaque. So first time out, um, two wins. Um, honestly, it, like I said, it was really kind of lucky that that actually worked out, but I just managed traffic a little bit better. But I did experience something unlike I've ever experienced in a race car in my 24 years of racing. So anybody that's been paying attention over the last month knows that Elkhart Lake just got completely repaved. And I mean, the entire track is repaved and it is like glass smooth, just like this. I mean, it's dark, it's smooth. It online, it had tons of grip in the dry. It was really a nice, nice surface to race on. Well, I was watching the radar before Sunday's race and it really looked dry. Like I didn't see anything coming. Everybody in the field was out on dry tires. Lap nine, it started to sprinkle in the carousel. I'm like, okay, so you gotta keep your tires warm. Maybe it's just gonna be a sprinkle, no big deal. So we get going, it's lap nine. Coming up to lap 10 on the front straight, I'm seeing spray off the tires in front of me. And I'm telling you guys, 
I didn't, first of all, I didn't want to put this car on the wall just because I was on slicks and in the rain, but it got so slippery. I had a, actually a pretty good lead, but by the time I got around to Canada Corner on that lap, Chris was like five car lengths behind me. And they ended up check, checkering the race early on lap 10 out of 13. And I am so glad they did because I went down into turn one on the cool off lap and couldn't make the corner. Almost ended up in the gravel in turn one on the cool off lap, second gear. Finally come back on the track, heading to turn three, and there's poor Aaron Johnson spinning in his S2000, noses it into the concrete barrier on the left. Ed Hosney in his F production CRX is spinning like a top heading down the hill. I get to turn three, and I'm down to second gear, probably 25, 30 miles an hour. No way I'm making the turn. Almost went into the gravel trap in turn three. Almost went all the way to the tire wall. And from there, I put it in first gear, 10 miles an hour, and made it around the track. It was the slickest track. It was basically black ice. There's no other way to describe it. I've never felt. I have been in the rain on slicks before. Um, not a ton, but enough to know that it doesn't feel like this. So. I guess a super hot track, all the rubber and the oils in it, and I'm telling you guys, it poured. Between lap nine and lap 10, it was pouring. So they checkered it, um, a bunch of people went off, I, a, a few people hit the wall on the cool off lap. So I've never seen that before. Fortunately, she uh, did not get any damage from that escapade, but um, all in all, a great weekend. I've got a whole page of things I want to do to the car over the winter, but here we go. It is time to focus our efforts on the BMW. So she's up in the air, nose is off. Um, I need to yank the tires off and start on my prep list. So runoffs prep starts for me in June. So that's where we're at. This is my focus. Uh, I've got a page long of things to do uh, to get ready for the runoffs. And we are going to see if we can get Greg Iyer that national championship this year. So that's my focus. And in the meantime, uh, I'll probably just clean the Mazda 2 up, put the cover on her, and she's just going to hang out. Um, wanted to congratulate some customers from the weekend, too. So John Brackey and his BMW uh, won both days. Now, John actually spent the time over the winter and stripped his Z3 to the bare chassis, like bare, bare chassis. Cleaned it up, repainted it, his, of course, Brackey red. Yeah, the car is beautiful. If you see it at the track, go check it out. It's like a show car. So really, really good job. He won both days. Uh, Mason Workman and, and actually won both days as well. He and Ken Kennard and Doug Weaver, all three custom, JPM engine customers, uh, had a good weekend. Uh, Ken, I mean, Ken had a good weekend going. He was actually leading the race when he got tangled up with a spinning car and was not able to finish the race on Saturday, and he used his backup car on Sunday um, just to get a finish. But Mason won both days, but Doug Weaver um, really has stepped up his game and was right there with him. So congratulations to those two guys uh, who podium both days. Um, but like I say, it is runoffs time, guys. It is getting hot outside, like really hot. So for me, it's time to stay in the shop get the cars, get all these motors going. We've got a ton of things to talk about as the summer goes on. I've got a bunch of projects to get started on after I get this slew of differentials going. Next week we'll be talking about engines. Um, and in the meantime, we'll do an update on BMW prep for the runoffs like we do every year. So hope you guys have received your limited edition t-shirts. I know some of you have because I've gotten some texts from you, those of you that have ordered them. I actually have not gotten mine yet but uh, I'm sure it'll be here any day. So uh, once again, I appreciate you guys ordering those. Got some good feedback on those. Um, really cool. And uh, appreciate you guys purchasing those. Um, and we're gonna move into uh, the summer. We're gonna call this the summer, summer break for me, but summer work runoffs prep for most people. This is the time of year when we go more to the lake, we hang more at the pool, um, rather than going racing when it's so hot. So that's kind of the way I live my life these days. So thanks for watching, guys. Uh, I know it's been a bit of a longer shop tour, but uh, lots of things to talk about. Super excited to uh, show you guys the development on the, of the Mazda 2 over the winter, all the little things I'm going to be doing to it. Um, and 
we're going to take it as it comes. So we've got three months runoffs prep ahead of us, and we will be at, geez, three months we'll be at the track. So uh, I look at that as weeks. So we've only got 11 weeks to get prepped for the runoffs here. So uh, as you guys know, I'm really diligent about prep. So, And I want to make sure the car is perfect for Greg. So that's kind of my goal. And, of course, all my other customers. So I know I'm babbling. Have a great rest of your week, guys. I'll see you next week. Take care.